What does it take for a narcissist to change? Can they even change? In this video, I'm going to talk about the narcissist wake up call and what it would take for a narcissist to change. Now, first, before we get into it, for those of you who are new to my channel, welcome. I'm Shanine Megji. I'm a transitioning coach. Welcome to my channel on toxicity is not your destiny. My mission is to help people navigate toxic relationships in their lives from a biblical, practical and spiritual perspective. So if you like this video, take a moment right now, click on that subscribe button and click on that bell because every single week I'm going to be bringing you a new video to empower you in navigating toxic relationships. So without further ado, let's dive into the subject. One of the big issues with a narcissist is their grandiose vision of themselves, which is their defense mechanism against an empty sense of self-worth. And it's this grandiose thinking that feeds into all other kinds of narcissistic attitudes like being arrogant, having a massive sense of entitlement, exploiting others for their own gain. All this grandiosity and the narcissistic attitudes that come with it are really rooted in pride and arrogance. And God treats narcissism in the Bible as a pride and arrogance issue. We know this because of how God dealt with narcissists in scripture. So in this video, I'll spend a few minutes discussing these examples and then talk about what psychology says about the fate of a narcissist. And then perhaps by gleaning both from scripture and psychology, we can get some understanding from both a spiritual and practical perspective on if there's any hope for a narcissist and what it would take for them to change. So let's begin. King Pharaoh and King Nebuchadnezzar were both narcissists. We know this because in the book of Daniel, King Nebuchadnezzar created a monument to himself to make himself like a god and require that people honor him as such. And so we also have examples of him having unreasonable expectations of his workers, getting into rages, but also love bombing those people that served him well, like Daniel. I won't go into details and references here, but I do teach more about this in my video called Benevolent Narcissist in Scripture, so check that out. So because King Nebuchadnezzar saw himself as a god and did not acknowledge God as being the god of the earth and the universe, God banished him into the wild for seven years where he lost his mental acumen and became crazy. And after seven years, King Nebuchadnezzar finally acknowledged God as God and not himself. Imagine being a king living in the laps of luxury and power on the world scene and then being reduced to living in the wild and losing your mind for seven years. It took that level of humbling and that much time to penetrate Nebuchadnezzar's grandiose thinking about himself and for him to finally admit that God was God of the earth and the heaven. Another example of a narcissist is King Pharaoh. God confronted his grandiosity by sending 10 plagues one after the other, with each one getting more and more intensive and destructive and closer to home to get to Pharaoh. It took 10 plagues that nearly decimated his entire nation and losing his firstborn son before Pharaoh finally relented and let the Israelites leave his country. But even then, his moment of acknowledging his defeat and his weakness as a human was very short-lived. When Pharaoh realized what was happening and that he was losing a great resource of all these millions of people that worked as slaves for his country for over 400 years, he changed his mind and pursued the Israelites relentlessly. So God had to drown Pharaoh and all his men in the Red Sea in the end. So King Pharaoh, after all the massive confrontation God did, was not able to come out on the other side acknowledging God as God and God as the ultimate authority of the earth and the universe and giving praise to him like King Nebuchadnezzar did. King Pharaoh fought and fought and fought right to his last miserable dying breath. So I share these two examples to show that God's way of dealing with a narcissist is to confront their grandiose thinking and he will use life events to show them that they're not God. God is God and they're actually nobody. The confrontations of God are to convey to the narcissist that they're not anyone special, but they're weak like the grass in the field. They're here today, gone tomorrow. They're the dust of the earth. They are no more different and no more special than any other human being in God's eyes. 
Now, human beings may be gifted very differently, may be called differently, but the value of each and every human being is the same in God's eyes. God does not play favorites. If the narcissist is enjoying a special position, God will see to it that they realize it's not because of any of their doing. It's God who promotes. The Bible says, but God is the judge. He puts down one and exalts another. And it also says, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. So a narcissist might think that it's their grandiosity that made them special, but it's actually purely the grace of God, which God can remove at any moment. So what does it take for a narcissist to change? Unfortunately, narcissism is a hardness of heart issue. And sadly, when there are no checks and balances in place to hold a narcissist accountable for his or her actions, they're prone to getting worse and hardening their hearts over time, like cement that just gets harder and harder. So what that means is that a narcissist needs a heavy duty wake up call. They need a crisis. They need a confrontation on every side. And I'm not talking about human confrontation. Human confrontations do not work because narcissists are wired to believe that other people, no matter how intelligent, how gifted, how talented or successful they are, are inferior to them. A narcissist will always find a way to discredit anyone that comes to them with a feedback or a confrontation. Even Jesus' words never landed on the ears of the narcissists around him who were the religious leaders of his day. His words got him nailed to the cross. So all that to say, you can't change a narcissist. Your words will never convince the narcissist in your life because a narcissist has already decided that anything you have to say to them has no validity. Here's what a narcissist needs for a wake-up call. They need the confrontation of the compounding effect of all their bad choices coming at them like a tidal wave, and they also need a confrontation from God, where God engineers all kinds of circumstances and events to challenge their grandiosity about themselves. In other words, a narcissist needs to go through a massive humbling process. That is the biggest domino in the narcissist's life that needs to be knocked over because once that is knocked over, then the other dominoes can fall like their sense of entitlement, their arrogance, their sense of self-importance, their exploitation of others, etc. And that humbling would have to be quite extreme on every side to really put up a mirror to the narcissist's face that they cannot ignore or avoid or deny or gaslight, a mirror that shows them who they really are. And that would be so blatant and so clear as day that no one can deny it, just as no one can deny that the sky is blue. And only God can orchestrate exactly the life events that the narcissist needs to force them to face their humanity in this way. And most of the time, this happens later on in life when the bad decisions and the sins of the narcissist catch up with them. It's like a convergence of all the consequences of negative past decisions starting to happen and then the narcissist having to face their humanity through the sheer reality of getting old. For example, the narcissist may suddenly hit a milestone birthday like being 40 or 50 or 60 and they realize they have nothing to show for. When the narcissist was young, it may have been one thing to jump into something new, and when that thing didn't work out, to jump into the other thing, and if that thing didn't work out, then go to the next thing. Or when the narcissist was younger, it didn't show when the narcissist would discard a person here or a person there because they had a following or a group of fans. So a narcissist is very erratic like that, jumping all over the place, not committing to anything or anyone for too long. And so when you're younger, in your younger years, it's easier to get away with that because time is on your side. But as time goes on with the discards and endings of relationships happening, by the time the narcissist gets older, they will be faced with more enemies stacked against them than fans or friends. Also, their peers, the people that they looked down on, who they deemed as inferior, who, were, who they thought were less intelligent, less talented, less everything than the narcissist, who were struggling while the narcissist was on top of the world in their earlier years, they're the ones faring much better. They're way ahead of the narcissist. They have successful jobs, happy, stable families. They're healthier. They're looking after themselves better. They may be taking nice vacations and traveling. And here the narcissist is struggling. 
The narcissist is not where he or she expected to be in his or her career or ministry or relationships or finances or health. And this happens because of the compounding effect of bad decisions catching up with the narcissist. So while the narcissist got away with a lot of things when they were younger, the contrast of the narcissist's life compared to other people's lives will stand in a much starker contrast and will be difficult to hide from. And all these things are the beginning of a narcissist's wake-up call. The other wake-up call that happens around this time is the narcissist realizing that they're getting older. They don't have the same strength and stamina and acumen as they had in their younger years, so that would for sure challenge their grandiosity. They're not as attractive as when they were younger. So if they prided themselves on their looks and now they're not getting that attention and that narcissistic supply, and all of a sudden these other younger, more attractive people are popping up and getting the attention and the accolades that they crave, this would be a huge blow to their fantasies of beauty. If they prided themselves on being strong and persevering like a machine, it could be a massive blow to their grandiosity that they have health issues and they get sick. So how do these wake-up calls change a narcissist? This is the time when a narcissist is highly likely to become depressed, maybe even suicidal, because everything on every side that used to feed and reflect back to them their grandiosity is now a mirror to show them their weaknesses and failures because all the things they pursued never amounted to anything of substance. They built sand castles on the beach instead of building a life on the rock. A narcissist can become severely depressed in this time and lose all interest in the things they were once interested in because those things, which were once a source of narcissistic supply, things that regulated their emotions to make them feel significant, great, worthy, important, are now having the opposite effect. They are now a sore reminder of how not great, not significant, not worthy the narcissist is. When I think about the narcissist depression, it reminds me of King Solomon in scripture. And I think most of the kings in scripture were narcissists, except for a few that were sold out to God. I think King Solomon had narcissistic traits because there are some things said about him that hint towards his narcissism. For example, Proverbs 19:12 says, the king's wrath is like the roaring of a lion, but his favor is like dew on the grass. The Bible calls it favor and wrath, but favor and wrath could very well be what psychology calls love bombing and narcissistic rage. After Solomon's death, the people complained that he was very hard on them. He extracted a lot of their resources and made their life difficult. And those would be actions of an opportunistic, exploitative king, which is narcissistic. And the interesting thing is that at the end of King Solomon's life, he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, which was really his reflection of his own life, but it has quite a weary and depressed tone to it. I'd say it's probably the most depressing book of the Bible. Instead of calling it Ecclesiastes, maybe it should have been called Solomon's Depression. In that book, Solomon realizes that everything he did was meaningless, like a chasing after the wind. And sadly, I think it takes an entire lifetime of events to catch up with a narcissist before they come to realize the foolishness of their lives and beliefs. So where does a narcissist go from here? All these life events, which can be both a compounding of poor life choices catching up with a narcissist, as well as God engineering life events to confront a narcissist can lead to three kinds of changes. Number one, the narcissist becomes depressed and suicidal and it leads to them giving up on their lives like Judas Iscariot in the Bible, who just gave up and ended it. In this case, their depression doesn't lead to a humility that calls out to God to save them, but more of a pride where they decide to take matters into their own hands and just give up. The second change is that the narcissist doubles down and adds more defense structures to protect their sense of grandiosity, which could mean that they become more paranoid, more delusional, and feed into their addictions more to avoid the trauma of facing reality. It could mean that they develop other mental illnesses that coexist with their narcissism to avoid post-traumatic stress. Number three, which is the best outcome and the thing to pray for, is that the narcissist humbles himself and turns to God and asks God for his help. 
Jesus said about the religious Pharisees, who were the narcissists of his day, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. He also said to the Pharisees, if you were blind, you would have no sin, but now you say we see, therefore your sin remains. So the best thing that can happen is that the narcissist humbles themselves and asks God to change them. But God is not going to impose on their free will. He's not going to force a change. But because he still loves the narcissist and doesn't want him or her to perish, he will engineer circumstances to confront them head on with their lives in order to get them to see their need for the great physician to heal them. So I hope this helps. If you're in the life of a narcissist and they are entering into a depression, you may be tempted to give them a boost and do things to lift them out of it because you can't stand to see them so low and miserable. But I would just caution you not to be too quick to take this type of action, but instead lean into God and see what he is up to in your narcissist's life. It may be much better for you to step away from your narcissist and let God step in than to take matters into your own hands because what you are seeing makes you uncomfortable. God may be setting things up for the narcissist to be in that very, very low place, eating the dirt from the ground, facing their humanity, and coming to terms with the reality that they are not that important. And it's a good thing. It could be the very thing they need to admit their need in order to be saved, healed, and delivered. So I would just encourage you to surrender that narcissist in God's hands and trust that God knows exactly the right circumstances to engineer for them to get to them. So I hope this video was helpful in giving you some insight on the kind of wake-up call a narcissist needs for change to happen. And if you're thinking of leaving or have left a toxic environment and you're in a season of transition, check out a free training I have put together. It's all about three key ways to navigate a transition. These are things that brought a massive breakthrough in my life when I was going through a difficult transition. I have included the link in the description box below. If you would like to see more content from me and have not subscribed yet, click that subscribe button and click the bell so that you can get the alerts because every single week I will be posting a new video to empower you to navigate toxic relationships in your life. And if you like this video, please give it a like. This just helps me to know what kind of content to produce. And if you have suggestions of other topics you would like me to cover, please feel free to drop your ideas in the comments section. I do read them and I do take note. So thank you so much. Thank you for watching. I appreciate you. This brings me to the end of my video. I look forward to seeing you in the next video.